From New York City, the makers of Clipper Craft Clothes for Men and more than 1,200 leading retail stores from coast to coast present that immortal character created by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, the world's most famous detective, Sherlock Holmes, starring John Stanley. <laughs> this week's story... The Adventure of the Devil's Foot. Holmes, why are we running up these stairs? Where are we going? To the room above, Watson. If we... <laughs> Holmes, listen! <laughs> the Devil's Foot is here in my room! The Devil's Foot! <laughs> the Devil's Foot? Good Lord, Holmes, what is that? Death, Watson. <laughs> A foul and fiendish death worthy of Satan himself. <laughs> We're at the door of Dr. John Watson's study and we're about to hear another of his adventures with the fabulous Sherlock Holmes. Well, good evening, Mr. Harris. <laughs> good evening, Dr. Watson. Uh, what memoir are you going to tell us about tonight? A very particular one, Mr. Harris. An adventure that Holmes himself classified as the strangest of his career. It took place in Cornwall. That brooding country of lonely and rolling moor. I see, Doctor. And, and what, what's it called? Well, Mr. Harris, Holmes always referred to it as the Cornish Horror. But in my memoirs, I have noted it as the Adventure of the Devil's Foot. And I shall be delighted to relate it to you after you have presented your audience with the merits of Clippercroft Close. Thank you, Doctor. Is there anyone anywhere who doesn't want a lot of value for his dollars when he buys a suit or a top coat? I doubt it. Most men want skillful tailoring, fabric that's long-wearing, looks that stand out in a crowd. And that's just what they get in a suit or overcoat with a Clippercraft label, and at a price they can afford to pay. Yes, Clippercraft is considered one of the greatest clothing values in America today, because dollar for dollar, you can't beat the values. A Clippercraft pure worsted suit, for example, is only $45. A Clippercraft top coat or overcoat is just forty dollars to forty-seven fifty, and there's quality in every inch of the fabric, every seam, every buttonhole. Yes, for a deliberately planned clothing buy that's honest to goodness quality and value through and through. See the fine Clippercraft clothes at your local independent store, a store you can trust. Compare Clippercraft with clothes selling for many dollars more. <laughs> And now, Dr. Watson, what about the adventure of the Devil's Foot? Well, Mr. Harris, it began in the spring of 1897. In that year, Holmes's iron constitution began to show some signs of strain. So we repaired for a holiday to a house on the tip of the Cornish Peninsula. Little did we suspect what was soon to transpire. It began one evening at a house called Tredanic Watha, near an old stone cross on a moor. Here... Mortimer Treganus had been visiting his brother George and his sister Brenda. It's a dark night on the moor, George, and a lonely walk to the village. Uh, come now. My dear brother Mortimer isn't afraid of ghosts and devils now, is he? George, why don't you stop? Why don't you let Mortimer alone? I... He lets us well enough alone, don't he, sister? The moor is not good enough for him. Oh, no. He has to live alone at the vicar's in the village. But you'd like to live in better style, wouldn't you, Mortimer? What do you mean? Uh, ye know what I mean. The shares of the tin mine father left to Brenda and me. You'd like to have them for your own, wouldn't you? George, please, you're being rude and uncharitable. I, perhaps I am, Brenda. I could never stomach a coward. I, I'm not a coward, George. It's just the way the moor is tonight. With the wind howling out there. And the moon gone. And that old stone cross. Standing naked against the sky and... <gasps> George, oh, I... what is it, Mortimer? I, I thought I saw something moving around out there. A figure in a black cloak with shining eyes. Evil eyes. <laughs> well, well, bless me. He's seen the goblins already, Brenda. Afraid to walk home now, hey, Mortimer? I wouldn't stay here another minute if you begged me to, George. I'm tired of your carping and your insults. I'll show you if I'm afraid to cross the moor. Mortimer. Good night. Mr. Draganis, 
Mr. Zagannis, wake up. It's Mr. Roundhay, the vicar. Please open the door, sir. What is it, Mr. Roundhay? Don't you realize it's four in the morning? Uh, Mrs. Porter, the housekeeper for your brother and sister out on the moor. She's just arrived with a message. The poor woman's terrified and fainted. Well, what is it, Mr. Roundhay? What's happened at Fredanic Water? There's been a disaster, Mr. Draganis. Some sort of awful, devilish disaster. <laughs> The lights are on in the house, Mr. Tregannis. Yes. I don't understand it, Mr. Roundhay. My sister and brother were perfectly all right when I left. Suppose we... Suppose we go in and take a look. I tried to get an account of what had happened from the housekeeper, Mr. Tregannis, but she was quite incoherent, and then... Good heavens, what's that? I, I don't know. It sounds like George. We, we'd better go in. <laughs> <laughs> oh, good heavens. Mr. Tregannis, your sister, she's dead. And your brother, Georgie, he's gone mad. They were playing whist. <laughs> it was the devil what come here. The devil. The devil. The devil. <laughs> This is a strange story you've just related, Mr. Treganis. A very peculiar set of circumstances indeed. I find them most fascinating. And most horrible, Mr. Holmes. Believe me, I am gratified that the vicar, Mr. Roundhay, persuaded you and Dr. Watson to look into this tragedy. We consider it most fortunate that you decided to take your holiday here. Yes, quite. Now then, Mr. Treganis. Yes, Mr. Holmes. As I understand it, your sister was found dead, and your brother was still holding his twist cards and laughing wildly. What do you make of it, Holmes? It's a little too early to form any conclusion, Watson. But to continue, Mr. Tregannis, you thought you saw something lurking out on the moor just at the time you were to leave the house last night. I, well, yes, I'm sure I did. What did you see? It looked like a man wearing a black cape, like some kind of weird devil out on the moor. Hmm. Interesting. Very. Watson. Yes, Holmes? Suppose we go to the house on the moor and question the housekeeper at once. Well, Mr. Holmes, that's my story. I was asleep, heard George laughing as though he were balmy, and found him. And if you ask me, it was the devil that did them both in. Indeed. Oh, come now, Mrs. Porter. The devil it was, Dr. Watson. Him that lives in the lonely wood of Beecham Arians, on the moor. Lives like a hermit, he does. And comes from the devil's roost in Africa. Interesting, Mrs. Porter. Very. And what is this satanic gentleman's name? Sterndale. Dr. Sterndale, he calls himself. Oh, Sterndale, the famous African explorer. Yes, quite, Watson. But, Mrs. Porter, why do you suspect this man, Sterndale? Uh, he's a man of strange and lonely habits and rough temper. And he was sweet on my mistress, Brenda Treganis. They knew each other? Aye. I've heard that he offered marriage, but she would have none of him. Watson, perhaps we'd better have a talk with this fellow, Sterndale. You seem to resent our morning visit to your retreat, Dr. Sterndale. I do. I intrude on no man's privacy, and I resent any intrusion on mine. State your business quickly and get out, before I throw you out and slam this gate behind you. Holmes, the infernal oh, cheek of... Watson. Dr. Sterndale, I must remind you that murder has been done. And although you may have bullied native bearers in the African jungle, you'll find that my colleague and I here are made of different metal. Now then, a question or two. Very well, but be quick about it. I understand you bear some distant relationship to the Treganis family. Very distant? What of it? And that when the tragedy happened, you were on your way to Africa. You had, in fact, reached Plymouth when you suddenly returned. You are well informed, Mr. Holmes. Thank you. I find facts to be strong allies in my business. 
Dr. Sterndale, how did you know of this tragedy, since it could not have been in the Plymouth newspapers? I received a telegram. May I ask from whom? The last it man, you're inquisitive. I take it, then, you do not propose to answer my question? I got it from the vicar, Mr. Round. Hey, naturally, I returned here to Cornwall and let my boat go. And now, Mr. Holmes, I had quite enough of you and your friends. Holmes, someone is coming. Yes, yes, Watson. It's the vicar. He seems to be in a great hurry. Yes. Mr. Holmes. Mr. Holmes. Yes? What is it, Mr. Roundhay? Speak up, man. We are devil-ridden, Mr. Holmes. There's a devil in the parish, and we are in the hands of Satan. What are you talking about? It's Mr. Treganis. Mr. Mortimer Treganis. He... He's suddenly gone mad. Stark, raving mad. <laughs> Dr. Watson, no wonder Sherlock Holmes considered this his greatest adventure. Yes, Mr. Harris. You have not heard the end of it yet. After you tell our audience something about Clippercroft clothes, I shall resume this weird story. We shall all join you in a minute, Doctor. Way back in the old days when men sat around a cracker barrel and talked about the cost of living, weighed their dollars, planned how much they'd spend for this or that, way back then, they would have recognized the Clippercraft suit or overcoat as a really good sound buy. Because Clippercraft clothes have all the steadfast quality you want at your kind of everyday price. Luxurious fabric, skillful tailoring, smart lines. They're made especially for men who like to look well-dressed but don't want to throw their budgets out of gear. They're the kind of clothes your local independent dealer is proud to feature because in times like these, they're worth every single penny and more than their price tags read. The reason you save so much when you buy a Clippercraft coat or suit is the enormous combined purchasing power of more than 1,200 stores throughout America. In other words, the famous Clippercraft plan. That's why men who know insist on Clippercraft clothes bearing the Clippercraft labels. So be sure to visit the Clippercraft store in your city. These leading stores in the metropolitan area are proud to add their names to Clippercraft in your suits, top coats, and overcoats. In Manhattan, Saks 34th, Broadway at 34th. John Wanamaker Men's Stores, Broadway at 8th and 67 Liberty Street. In Brooklyn, Abraham and Strauss. In Newark, New Jersey, Boulevard Men's Shop, Kresge, Newark. And in Jamaica, the B&B Clothes Shop, 16408 Jamaica Avenue. And now, Dr. Watson, you were relating to us the adventure of the devil's foot. So I was, Mr. Harris, so I was. After the vicar's dramatic announcement, Holmes and I joined him in his carriage. We raced out of the wood and across the desolate Cornish moor until we reached the village. At the vicarage, Holmes and I mounted the stairs two at a time toward Mortimer Treganis's room. And then... <laughs> Holmes, good Lord, listen, he's raving. Come on, Watson. Yes. Ah! It Holmes, it's... Oh, it was in this room, the devil's foot, the devil's foot... <laughs> Holmes, the devil's foot. What the juice? <coughs> Holmes, that, that pungent odor we detected at the house. It, it's in here. Quick, Watson. <coughs> Open the window. <laughs> right, Holmes. The devil's foot. Still present. The devil's foot. Yes. Yes, that's it. The devil's foot. <laughs> Holmes. Mortimer Treganis. It's too late to do anything for him now, Watson. Dash it, Holmes. What in blazes has happened? What is all this gibberish about a devil's foot? No time to answer questions now, my dear Watson. I'm going to examine the garden at once. Watson, I'm beginning to suspect what has happened. I... Aha! Uh -huh. What is it, Holmes? Observe, Watson. Note. This footprint here in the soft earth... It has a ribbed pattern. And here, on the leaf of this bush, observe, it's sprinkled with ashes. Ashes? What kind of ashes? The devil smokes a cigar, Watson. Come, let us go back to the room upstairs. Watson, look here. Where? On the windowsill. There are tiny bits of gravel. Well, what of it, Holmes? Significant, Watson, very. Especially when one notes the texture and color of this particular gravel. Note, too, that the lamp in this room is still burning. Well, I don't see what... Proof of the time of murder, Watson. 
Surely the lamp would not be burning if Mortimer Treganis had been murdered in broad daylight. This terrible tragedy befell him in an hour of darkness, possibly just before the dawn. And... One moment, Watson. Holmes, what are you doing with the smoke guard of that lamp? Uh -huh. What the deuce is it, Holmes? I am merely scraping a rather peculiar residue from the smoke guard of this lamp, Watson. Note this fringe of brown powder yet unconsumed. What does it mean? A series of curious coincidences, Watson. In each case, at the house on the moor and here at the vicarage, there was heat by fire. At the house, the fire in the hearth. Here, this lamp. In each case, there was a peculiar, pungent odor in the air. And in each case, madness and finally death was the result. Yes, but Holmes, what have all these got to do with the, with the devil's foot? I cannot be sure, my dear fellow, until we reach our own quarters. And there, Watson, we shall conduct an interesting and perhaps a dangerous experiment. Well, Watson, we're ready. Yes. You take that chair near the window. I shall take this chair near the lamp. Right, Holmes. Now, then, we shall light the lamp. And now, in this envelope, I have some small scrapings of that brown substance I took from Mortimer Treganis's lamp. Suppose I sprinkle it on this hot lamp shield. Yes, but Holmes, what produces the... <coughs> that odor. It, it's here, Holmes. It's in here. Steady, Watson. <laughs> oh, uh, that's funny. It makes my head swim. <laughs> what a laugh. <laughs> I want to laugh. Watson, Watson, can you hear me? It, it makes me want to laugh. I want to laugh. Watson, I've got to get you outside. It's in the air. Here. Put your arm around my shoulder, Watson. Steady, old man. Steady. <laughs> All right, my dear fellow. Oh, oh Holmes. Jove, I, I feel done in. Splitting headache. Oh, Watson, what? I shall never forgive myself. It was a foolhardy experiment to subject a friend to. Well, never mind that, Holmes. Did you draw any deduction from it? Indeed, I did, Watson, thanks to your generous cooperation. I'm able to tell you that the murders at the house on the moor and here in the vicarage were done by two different murderers and both brought about death by combustion. What? And second, I now have the secret of the devil's foot at hand. Holmes, what, what the juice is it? As soon as you're feeling better, Watson, I shall dispatch an urgent message to Dr. Sterndale. And after that, you shall hear the answer for yourself. Ah, good evening, Dr. Sterndale. Mr. Holmes, I am in receipt of your rather cryptic message. Ah, to be sure. And I'm at a loss to know, sir, what you can have to speak about that affects me in such an intimate manner. Would murder be reason enough, Dr. Sterndale? Murder? Precisely. You killed Mortimer Treganis. By the great Peter, Mr. Holmes, I've a mind to twist your neck. I've lived among savages in Africa these many years and beyond the law. You do well not to forget it. I have no desire to do you an injury. Nor have I any desire to do you an injury, Dr. Sterndale. Surely the clearest proof, knowing what I know, is that I have sent for you instead of the official police. What do you know, Mr. Holmes? I know that Mortimer Treganis killed his brother George and his sister Brenda. I know that you were deeply attached to his sister, that you returned when notified by the vicar and took your revenge. I know also that you and Mortimer both used the same method. The devil's foot. Holmes, what the blazes is this devil's foot? This, Watson... These tiny brown particles we found on Mortimer's lamp. What? Why, it's impossible. How did you know, Holmes? I didn't think anyone knew. It so happens my hobby is chemistry, Dr. Sterndale, and specifically the chemistry of rare poisons. Yes, but Holmes... Devil's I... foot, Watson, comes from a rare African plant. Devil's foot root. It induces madness, then death. The root is shaped like a foot, half human, half goat-like, hence the name. It's used as an ordeal poison by medicine men in certain districts of West Africa... I presume you brought back this specimen from the Ubangi country, Dr. Sterndale. Am I correct? Yes. Yes, that's correct. 
Mr. Holmes, how... Obvious, he... my dear doctor. Obvious. In some manner, Mortimer Treganis received some of this powder from you. Yes. I showed it to him on one occasion, and he must have stolen it. Precisely. Treganis coveted the shares his brother and sister owned in the family tin mine. When he left the house on the moor, he threw some of the devil's foot into the fire. Yes. Yes, he killed her. He killed Brenda out of his greed for money. But I loved her. I loved her more than anything in the world. That is why I lived near her on this desolate moor. How does it happen, Doctor, that you didn't marry her? Because I already have a wife, and she refuses to release me. When I heard that Mortimer had killed the only person I loved in this world, and when I heard how she had died, I knew. And so I returned. Quite. You woke Mortimer by throwing gravel on his window, a gravel peculiar to your own grounds. You requested an audience in his chambers and threw some of the particles on his lamp. Then you went down to the garden, smoked a cigar, and waited for him to die. So that was the footprint? Yes, Watson, of the very tennis shoes Dr. Sterndale's wearing now. Uh, Dr. Sterndale. Yes, Mr. Holmes? Why didn't you appeal to the official police? Accuse Mortimer Treganis yourself. I thought of that. The facts were true, but what jury would believe my fantastic story? And so I took justice into my own hands. Well, Mr. Holmes, there's my story. You can do what you will. I have no particular desire to live anymore. If you were a man who loved as I did, perhaps you would understand. Dr. Stendale, what were your plans? I had intended to bury myself in Central Africa and never return. My work there had only begun. Then by all means go. I'm not at liberty to prevent you. Oh, Mr. Mr. Holmes. You mean... I mean, Dr. Sterndale, that my investigation has been independent of the official police. I have never loved a woman. But if I had, and the woman I loved had met such an end... Well, I don't know. I don't know. Dr. Watson, that, that was a very strange and a very exciting adventure. Well, thank you, Mr. Harris. Of course, you'll understand why I could not disclose this particular memoir until only recently. Of course, Doctor. And now, Dr. Watson, what have we for next week? Next week, Mr. Harris, I shall relate to you the adventure of the bloodstained goddess. It concerns a dead body found under the gaslight on Baker Street, a desperate band of Chinese fanatics, and a manhunt through the streets of Limehouse. The makers of Clipper Craft clothes in more than 1,200 stores from coast to coast have brought you another in the new series of broadcasts featuring the world's most famous detective, Sherlock Holmes. Our stories are based upon the character Sherlock Holmes, created by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, and the program is produced and directed by Basil Muckrin. Sherlock Holmes is played by John Stanley, Dr. Watson by George Felton. This week's story was written by Max Ehrlich, with special music by Albert Berman. If you don't know your Clippercraft dealer, write Clippercraft, 200 Fifth Avenue, New York City. Be sure to listen next week to Sherlock Holmes in The Adventure of the Bloodstained Goddess. <laughs> this is Cy Harris speaking for Clippercraft Clothes. This is a mutual broadcasting system.